Today we're going to be covering the rights and protests topic of the apartheid. This is for the IV history course. The focus of this case study begins with the National Party triumph in 1948 and ends in 1964 when the state completed its crackdown on opposition and dissent by handing down terms of life imprisonment, imprisonment to Nelson Mandela and the other leaders of the African National Congress. To begin with, we have to establish a profile of South Africa. The Bantu migration from Cameroon to South Africa allowed the Sosha and the Sulu to settle in the region. A secular migration chartered by the Dutch East India Company, or the VOC, had established a settlement at the Cape of Good Hope in 1652, modern Cape Town. The expansion of both resulted in a few skirmishes. As a strategic point, the British, the British decided to make their way in. They established Port Elizabeth, East London, and Grahamstown, east of Cape. Here we have Cape Town, and then we're going to be seeing the British uh, colonies at the bottom right. After the abolition of slavery in the British Empire in 1833, many Dutch settlers took on north into Natal and Transvaal, calling it the Great Trek, hence the term Trekboer or Boer Trekker. At the time, the Sulu had set up a chain of wars known as the Mpekarne, making way for the Dutch. At the Battle of the Blood River in 1838, the Trekboer Boers showed off their weapons and won against the Sulu. Their victory helped them claim the Orange Free State and Transvaal, while the British claimed Natal only for a bit before the Boers took it back in the First anglo boer War. After the discovery of diamonds and gold in the region, a myriad of workers flooded in the South African Republic. Industry and political advantage helped shape Johannesburg and Cape Town as the white majority lobbied for segregation laws and more voting rights. The British and the Dutch clashed again only with a uh, British victory due to scorch earth tactics, tactics and concentration camps. This is also known as the Boer War. We have two Boer Wars at hand. After the Treaty of Berening, however, the Boer Republics were granted a measure of self-governance. A South African National Convention pushed for the South African Act, or the Act of Union, in 1909, making the country independent. Africaners who had fought for the British were now taking power over the government. Slowly but surely, segregationist efforts started, started piling in. First under South, the South African Party, or the SAP, and later under JBM, Hertzkort's National Party, or MP, before World War I. Tensions with white mine workers in the Red Revolt, the fa failed Afrikaner Rebellion, and the rise of unions helped Smots become Prime Minister in the 1920s. As World War II broke, more radical Afrikaners, led by Balan, now stood clearly opposed to the moderates led by Smots, who was supported by the major majority of English speakers. By 1948, Milan's National Party had been elected. So again, we're going to be looking at, at, at a lot of competition between the National Party and the African Amer the Africans who are living in the in the region. I mean, this is a small white minor minority who's taking over the the expense of a country that is hugely populated by Africans. The apartheid follows the assumption that human nature is based on the differences that constitute race and ethnic groups. It further assumes that there is a natural hierarchy of races due to inherent biological factors. Accordingly, the evidence of cultural achievement speaks to white superiority. The apartheid de uh, derived directly from social Darwinism, a philosophy popular in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, which applied Darwin's theory of natural selection to human society. Social Darwinists argue that survival of the fittest is a basic law of human nature and that superior races should aim to dominate inferior ones. Its difference, however, is that it's such justification in Calvinist scripture and science. Calvinism is an austere theology of the 16th century religious reformer John Calvin who argued that humankind is divided between the elect or those who have been chosen or predestined by God for salvation and those who have been condemned to eternal damnation. Again, the white people are going to be already saved by God, and they have the duty to take care of the rest of civilization. The rest of civilization is already condemned to eternal damnation. 
Calvin advocated a certain moralizing approach to society and government. African uh, history is basically shaped by the experiences of Turek Force. They also shaped the roots of exceptionalism in the region. This pious Dutch colonist, cut off from Europe and therefore isolated from its modern intellectual currents, cultivated an Old Testament worldview which led them to draw analogies between their experiences and those of biblical, biblical Israelites. They wanted to basically have this the savior complex. Slavery was part of their everyday life, and so racial inequality was taken for granted. African years can grew to equate Africans with the biblical sons of Ham, who were already condemned by God. After their triumph at the Battle of La River in 1838 against the Sulu, they believed that they were God's chosen people who would bring civilization to Africa in return for his favor. The attitudes of the newly settled British became increasingly racist. Their mindset was reflected in the 1853 Constitution of the Cape Colony, which distinguished between the two types of people, civilized and uncivilized, without referring specifically to their racial identities. However, the latter category obviously referred to the social population, who would henceforth be subjected to certain punitive laws. These included the requirement that they should carry passes. These were documents that they would be obliged to produce when traveling outside the immediate vicinity of their residence or employment. Whenever they were in a city, they had to carry these passes. Passes would be used to regulate the movement of black people, but could also prevent them from leaving their jobs and seeking work elsewhere. Following the outbreak of the bubonic plague in Cape Town in 1901, legal residential segregation was introduced for the first time with the establishment of Blacks Only Township of Ndaveni, excuse the pronunciation, located far away from the city center. The Boer Republic's racial discrimination was also widely practiced in the two Boer Republics in the interior, the Transvaal, officially known as the South African Republic, and the Orange Free State. While the institution of slavery was not legally established, it was still widely practiced and their constitutions were ex uh, explicit in declaring white supremacy. In Johannesburg, the capital became populated by fabulously wealthy, mainly English-speaking mining magnates known as the Randlords. The dispute between the so-called Uitlander population and the landlords on the one hand and the African Union government of Paul Kruger on the other over the issue of whether to extend the right to vote to all white people in the Republic was one of the main causes of the South African War of 1899 to 1902. However, they all agreed to perpetuate white supremacy in politics and economics. Therefore, the, Af the South African National Party decided to implement a system of segregation. One of the main objectives of the new South African party government, led by Louise Botha and Jan Smuts, was to change in law a comprehensive system of racial segregation. The Act of Union, officially known as the South Africa Act itself, re restricted all voting rights to the, mi to the mi minority white population, with the exception of the very small number of colored and blacks who were, had previously met the narrow franchise qualification in the Cape Province and NATO. The Mines and Works Act of 1911 reserved all semi-skilled positions in the mining industry for whites, meaning that blacks had no option but to accept poorly paid on skilled jobs in the cities or on rural farms. The Native Lands Act of 1913 was a piece of uh, was a landmark piece of legislation and the forerunner of the apartheid homeland system. The Natives Land Act prohibited Africans who made up over two-thirds of the population from owning or renting land anywhere outside certain parcels of territory that would be designated as native reserves. The native reserves made up roughly 7.5% of the total area of the country, and they were to be set aside for the exclusive use of Africans. Only those under white employment could reside outside these overcrowded spaces. This also ended the practice of rural sharecropping further limiting the economic possibilities of Africans. The Native Urban Areas Act of 1923 was another cornerstone of the segregationist system. It decreed that the cities were principally for the use of the white population, and that any Africans resided there would be required to carry passes. 
In 1924, the, the SAP was swept from power and replaced by an NP-led coalition government under J.B.M. Herzog. Herzog's approach to segregation was embodied in civil labor policy. The Representative Natives Act of 1936 removed Africans but not coloreds from the electoral role in the Cape. It also established an advisory Native Representative Council made up, of largely, uh, made up largely of traditional African leaders, which lacked any real power. South Africa's entry into the Second World War on the side of the Allied powers had a major impact on the country. Herzog resigned from the government over his much support of the war, and his subsequent reconciliation with Malan led to the renaming of the Nationalists, who became known as the Herenni Nationali Party. Reunited National Party, or simply NP. In 1946, a hundred thousand gold miners organized a strike with the leadership of the African Mine Workers Union, AMWU, only to be defeated by the police. Smuts' government's response was to set up the Fagan Commission, which suggested the relaxation of past laws and the normalization of the status of blacks who lived in cities. This became the basis for the UP Policy Manifesto. The NP, in opposition, set up the Sour Commission, which concluded that the survival of the white race in South Africa depended on the segregated status of the country. For the established Africaners, the latter sound better. Here's our bibliography. Thank you for, uh, to Mark Rogers and Peter Clinton for their fabulous book, and we recognize the authors are of the pictures and the auditory content in this presentation. Thank you.